Arts. And I'm so excited to have you joining us for our May Art at Noon talk in commemoration of the anniversary of the Victory in Europe Day, which happened 75 years ago today. If you're watching the live stream, please feel free to ask questions anytime in the chat and we'll pose those questions to our speaker at the end of the presentation. Our speaker today is Dr. Corey Campion, Associate Professor of History and Global Studies and Director of the Master of Arts and Humanities program at Hood College. An expert in modern European history and transatlantic relations, he teaches a variety of undergraduate and graduate courses on European and global history, Americanization, the First World War, and apiculture. His past research has focused on the Allied occupation of Germany after the Second World War, as well as the history of American and European beekeeping. Currently, he is working on a co-authored interdisciplinary monograph that compares memories of the First World War in Britain, France, Germany, and the United States, as depicted in the liter literary and memorial landscapes of the 1920s and 1930s. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Corey Campion. Thank you, Kristen, and thanks to everybody for, for joining us. Um, I, I ask that you, you bear with me. I'm, I'm a novice at this, uh, at this Zoom stuff, so um, I will do my best. Um, but I'm really excited to, to talk to you all today. Um, the, you know, the, the idea of, of war memorials and memory in general is something that really is um, not just an academic interest, but a, a real passion of mine. Um, if my wife were here, she would say that we go to far too many memorials and cemeteries. Um, I just noticed a new one the other day in Frederick I hadn't been to. So that's our next stop when we go out to the grocery store. I think you can go to a cemetery. Um, it's really an interest of mine um, that's been brewing for, for quite some time now. And though most of my work focuses on the First World War, um, uh, as Kristen noted, I've done a lot of work on the Second World War. And in preparing this talk, um, I've, I found some really interesting connections between memories of World War I and World War II. Uh, and I'll share just a few of those as we, as we uh, go along today. Um, the other thing I'll just say at the outset is that um, I, I am not an art historian, so this will not be a deep lecture on aesthetics of memorials. Um, but rather what I want to try to do today is to do what most historians do, and that is to put things in their context. So uh, we mark today the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, um, and I want us to look at, at how that has uh, been, uh, that, that moment has been remembered in physical memorial landscapes. Um, and I want to put World War II memorial landscapes focusing largely on the United States um, in, in their broader historical context, uh, which I think is, is really important because um, in order to understand what something like the National World War II Memorial on the Mall is doing, um, you, you really need to know what has sort of come before it because that memorial is very much in conversation with, with a longer uh, term tradition um, in, in American memorials. Um, so uh, a lot of the photos today, the vast majority of them are, are photos that I've taken on all of my memorial um, escapades. And so um, I'm looking forward to sharing them with you. And if you have questions, uh, feel free, as Susan said, to enter them in the chat room and then we can, um, we can answer them uh, at the end. But I want to start off here with a, with a title slide, and I'm going to make the, the move that historians often make, which is to play with dates. So um, we've already said several times that today marks the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. Um, and I want to ask a little bit, does it? Do we have the date right? Um, we're talking about memories of the Second World War. Um, but what exactly are we marking when we say victory in Europe day? Um, a little bit of history. Um, the, the Second World War, what we're talking about today, victory in Europe, is the defeat to, of the Nazi Reich by the Allied forces. Um, it was actually on the 7th of May 1945 that Alfred Jodl, um, acting on behalf of the Reich government, um, agreed to General Eisenhower's demand for an unconditional surrender. Um, and so one could say that the war actually ends on the 7th of May, 1945. Um, there's actually on the 8th of May, 1945, a signing ceremony in Reims in France, um, where the Germans sign the, the document of unconditional surrender, um, declaring that the fighting will end at 11 p.m. Uh, on the 8th of May. But it gets a little bit more complicated because it turns out 
um, that this signing ceremony on the 8th of May, 1945, there were actually two of them, in part because the Soviets wanted a second one to take place in Berlin, Hitler's capital. Um, the signing ceremony lasted until the wee hours of the morning. And so the document is actually not officially signed and, and done until the 9th of May, 1945 but they backdated it because of the date of the early armistice. If I've confused you, that wasn't my intention, but my point is that often the end of, of, of historical events is hard to pinpoint, and that can make remembering these events very difficult. Um, I think in general, we've got it right that the war in Europe ends on May 8th, 1945. But if you notice the New York Times um, uh, front page from, from that day that, I, that I've pulled up on the, on the title slide here, the war in Europe has ended, sur surrender is unconditional, VE will be proclaimed today. The next line, our troops on Okinawa gain. The war is in fact still going on. So for us to say that today marks the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II is a bit misleading because in fact, there's a war on another front in the Pacific going on. And this is precisely what makes um, memories of the Second World War so complicated. And we'll see that translate into the physical memorial landscape. Um, this war was fought on multiple fronts and it doesn't end at the same time everywhere. And so, um, you know, when we think about memories, we, we, we first think about dates. What is it, when is it that we're remembering? Um, and it's pretty complicated for World War II. So with that, uh, with that in mind, um, I want to start off just, just briefly um, uh, thinking about the kinds of symbols and the, um, uh, the, 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 the forms that have uh, shaped memory uh, leading up to the Second World War. Um, if you look at the Western tradition, that is to say the Greco-Roman Judeo-Christian tradition that most modern European and, and certainly North American nation states draw on when they build memorials. There are some central forms that are repeated. Um, one of them, if, uh, Kristen, is my, my cursor is appearing on the screen here? I'm right over the mound. Is it? Okay, good. Um, so one of them is actually a, a mound. And the mound that you see here, it's a, it's a mound of, of earth over a grave. Um, this is the mound at, uh, at, at Marathon, which is covering the grave of 192 Athenian soldiers uh, who died fighting against the Persians in 490 BC. Um, this mound, the sort of raised earth over a gravesite, is, is very common. We'll see it throughout the ancient world, carried through to the medieval period. And I think we see echoes of it even in the 20th century. Um, another very common form uh, that we see in memorial landscapes is here. This is an Egyptian obelisk, obviously, but it's an example of a stell, uh, a sort of upright uh, uh, pillar um, on which uh, history, dates, uh, important moments, thoughts are, are inscribed. Of course, the modern version of this would be um, any of the military headstones that you see that record not only the name of the person buried in the grave, but the regiment they fought with, the date they died, sometimes where they died, where they were from, um, a sort of textual memorial, if you will. Um, other common forms are the arch. Um, this here is the arch of Titus in Rome, which is uh, commemorating the capture of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Um, of course, there are many arches in memorial landscapes. Probably the one that most comes to, to, to my mind, but again, I'm a Franco-German historian, is the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, um, which is uh, built at the start of the 19th uh, century, finished uh, after um, Napoleon's fall, um, but dedicated to the greatness of the French Revolution and to the Napoleonic regime. I have to say, as much as I love the Arc de Triomphe, it's always a little weird to me because it really is a monument to a fallen regime. Um, and it's one of Paris's central landmarks, and it's just sort of um, odd, but, but yet it doesn't seem to evoke defeat. Um, people tend to see it as a symbol, I think, of, of, of all that's great about Paris. Um, but archways are, are, are very common. We'll see these as well. Uh, and then the other symbol of it that, that I want to point out is the, is the cross, um, which ends up being, in fact, the chosen symbol for most of the headstones in American military cemeteries uh, in Europe. Um, which was not without, without controversy. This is a cross that's actually in Arlington National Cemetery. It's the Argonne Cross, 
uh, which was actually put up in 1923 to commemorate those who lost their lives um, uh, near the Argonne Forest during the First World War. Um, about 26,000 Americans killed um, in that battle in September through November of 1918. Um, and the cross stood in that place until it was um, uh, oddly destroyed. I've never been able to figure out what that means, but Arlington's formal website says the cross was um, accidentally destroyed in 1981, and this one was put back up in 1982. So it's actually a replica um, of what was there in 23. Uh, but these are um, nevertheless the forms that we're going to see uh, repeated. And, and, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because when we get to memory of the Second World War, there's a real debate about how the Second World War should be captured in memorial form. And there are many calls to move away from this long tradition of memorial language that includes mounds and arches and stells and crosses and to come up with something brand new. Uh, but as we'll see, what that brand new thing is supposed to be is very difficult. Um, so there is a certain language here, if you will, a symbolic language, a, a, a formal language um, that, uh, that is the language of memory in the Western tradition, and, and that's what we'll see shape uh, our, our memories of May 8th, 1945. So keeping these basic shapes in mind, I want to talk just a little bit about the memorial culture in the U.S. that sets up what we see um, uh, in, 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 in the U.S. after, after 1945. And so I, I want to take us to the Civil War, uh, which is really um, marks an important moment in the history of American memorials. Um, there really aren't a whole lot of military memorials in the country uh, prior to the Civil War. Um, and there are also those memorials that existed had very different forms. Um, one of the things that we see emerge with the Civil War um, is first off the federal, federal government's um, uh, efforts to create these beautiful national military cemeteries, these garden cemeteries, these beautiful landscapes, think Arlington National Cemetery. Um, that becomes something new, that we're going to have this sort of hallowed ground where soldiers are buried, uh, where they're named on their headstones, and where we remember not just individuals, but, but collective armies and, and, and collective points of conflict in, in the nation's history. Um, the other thing that takes place um, with, with the Second World War, with, with, with the Civil War, um, is the, the uh, erection and construction of um, citizen soldier monuments. So the idea of portraying individual soldiers. Um, we have here an individual soldier monument. This is actually at the cemetery at Antietam National Cemetery, um, which includes some World War I and World War II, I believe, uh, graves. Um, it's called the Private Soldier Monument. It was actually built in 1880 and it first, um, it was erected here in 1880, but it first actually stood at the Centennial Exhibition uh, in Philadelphia in 1876, and then it was moved to Antietam and placed there. But again, this, this, this idea of a, of a plinth with a soldier, a kind of stereotypical uh, generic soldier um, on top watching over the dead or watching over a town square becomes something new. Um, the other thing that you see are regimental memorials. This is the Pennsylvania State uh, Memorial that's erected at Gettysburg. Of course, Gettysburg is one of the first national cemeteries. Lincoln, of course, gives his famous address there during that, um, uh, during that process of opening that, um, that memorial landscape. These elaborate memorials to, to state reg to, 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 to the people from states that serve, to individual regiments. If, if anybody here has been to Gettysburg, I'm guessing many have. Um, it's often what, what I think of what I describe to students is kind of memorial overload. I mean, there are just, it's just constant memorials. I mean, they're, they're maybe 50 feet apart. And that raises all kinds of questions then about what is it that we're remembering at Gettysburg? Because if we're remembering everything, then are we really focusing on anything in particular? And this is precisely a critique that is raised after the First World War and certainly after the Second World War. I mean, Gettysburg becomes for art critics and architects um, and, and scholars of memorials, a kind of study in what not to do as we get into the 20th century. Um, and then of course, on the Confederate side, we have the Johnny Rebel statues, which are up. This is in Albemarle, Virginia in front of the courthouse. These are of course points now of tremendous controversy and many are being taken down um, as these memorial landscapes are challenged and, and, and rethought. 
But, but the point is that the Civil War sets up for us um, this idea of uh, regimental memorials, of individual memorials, and the form of the individual soldier on top. And I think that very much speaks to the rise of the 19th century, the idea of nationalism, the idea of individual citizens having meaning as part of a broader community. And so we see a move away from an older tradition, which just sort of marked an army or a war. And now we're actually trying to recognize um, uh, individuals. So if we move then um, to the First World War, um, what we see is when, when, when the war uh, ends, uh, actually, um, even before the war ends, the, the, the American government is trying to figure out what to do um, in, in terms of remembering the First World War. The First World War is, of course, uh, sort of America's first major national engagement in a foreign conflict. It's a war that Americans, I think, to this day still have a very difficult relationship with. Um, very much unlike our relationship with World War II, which I think uh, in general, the American public is very comfortable with. World War II is a, uh, it tends to be a, a pretty easy and frankly appealing um, uh, a narrative. I mean, it's a war against absolute evil in the Nazi Reich. Who could, who could argue anything otherwise? And America is, is, is the, uh, the defender of democracy um, against this, this, this totalitarian national socialist uh, regime. Um, it's, it, it's a pretty simple cut and dry narrative. World War I was not that. Um, the nation was very divided over whether or not the U.S. should get involved. Um, there were tremendous um, uh, German immigrant populations um, in the United States, as well as Irish populations that complicated um, uh, the ideas about, about where American loyalty should lie. When the U.S. finally does get involved in 1917, the, the, the country undertakes the first effort ever to, to mobilize a national army and send it overseas. Um, and there are all kinds of tensions, social, um, uh, racial tensions that are, that are um, you know, challenging that effort all along the way. And so trying to remember what this war is, a war that nobody really understood and, and, and everybody had different views about, was really quite difficult. Um, so what the U.S. government actually does um, is to set up um, a commission to, to handle this. Um, it's called the American Battle Monuments Commission. Um, it's actually uh, given a congressional mandate. It's created by, uh, by Congress uh, right as the war ends. Uh, General Pershing, who you see here, the head of American forces during the war is actually made the head of this. Um, uh, of this commission. And the commission also decides to work very closely with the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts, um, which was actually set up by Congress in 1910, a seven-member board to oversee, um, in part, um, our artistic constructions, memorial constructions of the U.S. government, particularly those that are, that are erected um, uh, overseas. Uh, and so together, these two bodies are going to work to try and create a memorial landscape that is fitting uh, for what America did in the First World War. Um, there's a couple of key points here, and, and, and this, this comes back up again with the Second World War. Um, the leaders that, that were involved in these two, uh, these two organizations wanted to build monuments that um, recognized the victory of the United States and the Entente forces, um, and that also, quite frankly, disguised the divisions of American society uh, at the time. Um, this was, as I said, a very controversial war. Um, this is a nation that is in no way knit together in 1917 when it goes off to war. Uh, and um, just as, 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 as American leaders hoped that American memorials overseas could be an emblem of democracy, there was also a hope that World War I memorials could kind of provide a sense of unity um, where it was otherwise lacking in day-to-day -day life in American society. So um, this is very much a top-down process. The, the, the government is, has a very tight control over what memorials will be built. Um, there's also a response to the Civil War. They clearly did not want a repeat of something like Gettysburg. Um, there's a, there's a, I don't want to say a ban, but it's close to a ban on individual private memorials. Um, I won't go into it, but there's actually a really interesting story. There's an American unit in France uh, that somehow manages to get control of a little piece of land and it erects a private memorial um, uh, to its fallen comrades. And Pershing almost has to come to blows with his own soldiers over this because it's a violation of a Franco-American treaty. The French government really doesn't want to tell these soldiers to take their memorial down, but it's a private memorial in violation of U.S. policy. I mean, it's a real mess. 
Um, but the, the AMBC had, had this policy that they wanted to sort of stitch together a narrative of the war and not have a bunch of competing memorials uh, to, to individuals and to, and to regiments. Um, the other thing that, that the AMBC wanted to do was to locate these memorials in a very familiar memorial language. So it's the old Greco-Roman Judeo-Christian language, what we started off with, it's archways, it's stelles, um, it's crosses, uh, it's, it's mounds. Um, they wanted classical or medieval designs. They weren't interested in avant-garde, modern uh, art and, and, and these kinds of things. Um, they also adopted the cross as the headstone for soldiers to be buried overseas, which, as I said, um, was a point of controversy. Not every soldier who died was Christian. Um, some were agnostic, some were, uh, some were Jewish. Um, and so there is this sort of uh, controversy surrounding this, but the AM, uh, uh, the ABMC uh, rather decides that, you know, this is by and large a Christian country and that's the message that's going to, 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 be, to be given there. Um, so, so what is it that the, that the Battle Monuments Commission does? Well, they start to build cemeteries uh, in Europe and these will be connected to the Second World War. Um, this is a wonderful cemetery that is located um, in Suresnes, uh, which is a, a neighborhood just outside of, of Paris. Um, it's called the Suresnes Cemetery. Um, I don't know if any of you have been there. I'll show you a picture in a moment of the, of the view. It is absolutely breathtaking. Um, I've been there several times. I took students there last, uh, last spring. Um, this is a cemetery that was set up. Um, it's on a hill, as I said, just overlooking Paris. Uh, in 1917, for those American soldiers who were in hospitals in Paris during the First World War and died, it was a place for them to be, uh, to be buried. And so uh, the U.S. starts uh, creating this, this, this cemetery. Um, it was actually uh, during the Paris Peace Conference, during the Versailles Peace Conference, if you will, in 1919, uh, when President Wilson, seen here with his wife, um, actually steps out of the Versailles Conference and on Memorial Day went to Suresnes uh, and uh, laid a wreath and had the first Memorial Day ceremony there in May of 1919. Of course, the Treaty of Versailles is signed the following month. Um, a little story that I shared with Kristen yesterday, but it's just one that uh, really just warms my heart. I took students there last spring. We were there uh, touring memorials and marking the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. Um, and somehow the, the cemetery staff figured out that we were an American college group um, uh, touring this, this cemetery. Um, and it was, as I said, Memorial Day. You can see the American and French flags are, are laid out for that on all of the graves. And we were there near the end of the day. And just as we were about to leave the cemetery, um, they began to play taps, which they do every evening. And of course, my colleague and I organizing the trip, we thought, wow, what a cool moment. I mean, we're here a hundred years to the day after Wilson celebrates the first Memorial Day. And now, you know, the students get this great experience. Now they're playing taps. What could be better? Um, well, what could be better was um, we were right down at the bottom of this hill on the grass and I, had, I wanted to do a group photo. So I had everybody sort of lined up right here. And as I'm taking the picture, I see this guy in a suit coming toward me and I thought, oh boy, we're gonna get yelled at for being on the grass. Um, we didn't. What he said was, um, we're getting ready to lower the flags and we wanted to know if your students uh, would be interested in lowering the flags and folding them. And so our students got to participate in that ceremony and it was really, really cool. I mean, again, a hundred years after the first memorial ceremony there, it was a, it was a, a great, great experience. Um, but, but that aside, what you have uh, uh, built here up then over the 20s and the 30s um, is very common for American Battle Monument Commission cemeteries uh, in Europe. You have a chapel that's built here. Um, there's a mosaic inside of an angel of victory. Uh, and then you have the graves uh, out front, uh, which, are, uh, which are all crosses with the names of the, um, uh, of the fallen, uh, where they were from and, and, and what units they fought in. These wings that you see here did not exist after the First World War. These are actually added later after World War II. Um, but this is a very common, common landscape. And I think when you stand here, if you look up, it's very easy. I think if I hadn't told you this was in France, you might say, well, that's like Arlington Cemetery or some sort of American landscape. And that's precisely what the US government wanted. They thought that these memorials overseas could be a reminder um, to, 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 to foreign nations of American commitment to democracy and to, to overseas endeavors. Um, 
But of course, it, it isn't an American uh, landscape. If you go up to the top here, this is standing in front of the chapel lookout, you have what I think is one of the best views of Paris, even better than Montmartre. Uh, I really can't recommend it enough. You have, of course, the Eiffel Tower out here in the distance, and you can see the rest of the city as you, as, as you move along this, um, uh, this patio here. Um, so this is the very typical move that's made by, by the government after World War I to create these, uh, these cemeteries. And, and, and this is officially then uh, inaugurated in, in, in 1937. Um, they have a dedication ceremony there marking memory of the First World War, but note the date in 1937, right? The Second World War begins in 1939, it ends in 1945. This thing isn't even officially 10 years old when World War II ends. And so that's important when you start to look at World War II memorials, many of them build on World War I memorials because in fact, the World War I memorials had just been finished um, only a few years before, before that conflict. Um, moving from, uh, from Suren, then what you also see are these monuments that again, the US government, the um, the Battle Monument Commission uh, uh, sets up. Um, this is an example of, of one of those monuments that you see. Uh, this is the Mont Sec uh, monument, um, which marks the Battle of Samiel. It sits atop a, a, an enormous 300 foot high hill as you approach uh, through all of these French villages out around Western um, uh, uh, or rather Eastern France, this is the only thing that you see. I mean, it just dwarfs the landscape. It just towers over everything. Um, and the Americans um, built this monument to, to again mark those who served in the Battle of Samuel, one of the first American engagements in the First World War. You'll notice the style again is very much what the US government wanted. It's that traditional columnar sort of Greco-Roman looking structure, an open colonnade. Um, the way that this was uh, that this was constructed, and it was designed, uh, by the way, by an architect from New York. Um, the U.S. had to acquire this land, and so they purchased the land from the neighboring French farmers. And there's a great story about. Um, well, I spent a lot of time in France. I'm, I'm really quite at home there, um, but they don't get in as much of a hurry as we do, and um, they didn't in signing these real estate deals. And so, what the U.S. government finally does is to have basically a big neighborhood party with a lot of wine and food, and had everybody over and said, oh, by the way, while you're enjoying your dinner, can you finally sign these sale documents so that we can have this land and build this monument? Um, and so they, they, they acquire the land. Um, and this, this monument is also officially dedicated uh, in, in 1937. Again, note the date. Um, so just an example of what you see inside, you can start to see the, the, the surrounding French landscape here, inscriptions of the, uh, of the battles and, and, and where soldiers uh, fought. This is looking through the colonnade. I mean, you can see how high we are up at this place. But there's an interesting detail about this memorial that I just thought was fascinating. So on the front, there's an inscription in French. There's another one in English that talks about this memorial being a perpetual symbol of Franco-American cooperation. That's, of course, a, a theme that is reiterated at, 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 at D-Day ceremonies and, and, and May 8th ceremonies throughout the 20th century and still today. Um, France and the United States both call on World War II, but also World War I is this, this moment that solidified the nation's uh, friendship. And so that's, that's, that's marked there. The other thing that's interesting is the inside of this. So inside on one of the walls of this colonnade is this inscription here. And what it does is to narrate the fact that this monument actually lay, so it's in France, but it lay in Nazi occupied France. And as American troops and other allied forces were advancing from the beaches of Normandy uh, during the Second World War to liberate France, they actually came upon this, uh, upon this hill, um, which the Nazis had taken and were using as, as a sort of machine gun nest, if you will. And so the Americans had to fire on their own memorial in order to liberate and take this piece of land. And the memorial was actually damaged. There are actually bullet holes in the rock um, uh, and, and, and you can see them. And there's this inscription there that uh, marking this damage and noting that the that the uh, memorial had to be uh, repaired after the war. And so I just think that's a really interesting example of what happens so often with World War II memorials is that they find themselves at the intersection of World War I and World War II, not always directly in the, the literal line of fire, um, but there is this, this really interesting connection that's there. And so, you know, that, that just raises all kinds of questions. What does this now mean? This was designed, built, intended, dedicated as a World War I memorial, but it bears the scars of World War II. And so what is this space now uh, remembering, I think it takes on a, a, a much greater 
a much greater charge. Um, so these are the types of things that the US government builds overseas. What takes place at home? Um, what takes place at home is a, 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 a kind of more of the same, but a little bit different. Here we do see individual um, memorials. Um, we also see echoes of the Civil War um, and memorials, the individual soldier memorials. So the most popular memorial form after World War I uh, is here. This is, this is a, a, a memorial that's in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, it's a doughboy. Uh, statue. This is the, uh, the, the form of the doughboy, the name of American soldiers in the First World War um, that was actually developed by E.M. Vikesny, a, um, a, a sculptor who made um, a very popular form of a doughboy, always in a triumphal form. Usually these are made out of bronze. They're actually hollow. Um, here holding a grenade in the sort of victorious pose. Usually, I think if you see just a little bit here, my arrow, this is a, a, a sort of shot off tree trunk and there's some barbed wire around it, which is an echo of no man's land. Sometimes there's a hint of captured, you know, a German artillery or a German helmet or something that can, that can be at the base of this. And then usually um, a rifle, sometimes a bayonet, it depends. Very interestingly, like as you go through the 60s and 70s, a lot of the bayonets are taken off of these statues because communities decided that was too violent. And now as we get to the centennial, they're adding bayonets back. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, whole, a whole thing with Doughboy statues. Um, <clears throat> but these became very popular and then often towns will list the names of those who, who, who fought and served, um, sometimes just the names of those who died. Uh, very popular, um, you, you, you purchase a, a, a pedestal, you buy the statue, usually through um, public donations, sometimes through government funding and, and you have your memorial. <clears throat> Art critics um, said this is like the Civil War all over again. These statues are, are, are hideous. Um, they're, they're old. They're iconic from, from, it's like something from the Middle Ages. Uh, this doesn't speak to this new kind of war that we had in World War I. Um, <clears throat> And they also criticize them for being mass produced because many of these were simply ordered out of catalogs. You could go through catalogs of doughboy statues and pick whatever one you wanted and order it and have it brought to your town. Um, <clears throat> I do mention since I imagine we have a largely local audience here, Frederick's World War I Memorial is unique. Um, and so I thought it was just worth mentioning here. Um, this is the Frederick World War I Memorial in Memorial Park. Um, which is a long history and I, I, I promised myself I won't let myself tell the whole story, um, but it is a fascinating memorial. It's put up in 1924. Um, it's designed by an Italian born sculptor from Pittsburgh named Giuseppe Moretti. Uh, it's, a, it's a sort of, again, you see the Greco-Roman throwback, the allegorical figure here of a victory holding um, <clears throat> an olive branch, uh, but also a sword sort of implying that, that war could start again, but, but boy, we hope there is peace, which is very much the sentiment of 1924. And then of course, lists of those who, who served uh, from Frederick County. Um, the interesting thing about this monument, um, it's actually segregated. It segregates uh, out African-American soldiers uh, by denoting that, um, which in many ways is sort of regressive for the time, but then the memorial is also quite progressive for the time because it lists women who serve from Frederick County, which is very uncommon. Um, so there's a lot going on here. Um, and um, yeah, it's just, it's fascinating. But this is a really sort of unique example. More often what you see are just simply plaques of names or, or at most a kind of doughboy statue. And these then begin to dot the landscape of American towns and cities over the 20s and into the 30s, right on into <clears throat> the eve of the Second um, World War. <clears throat> Just a couple of others, again, thinking about the forms that we see. We have a, a, a victory arch that appears here in New York City. Um, this, this victory memorial was built as a temporary archway. Um, the, the, the mayor wanted to do something big for these homecoming parades that, was going, that were going to begin you know, taking place. The decisions made in March, which is almost too late because soldiers are already starting to come home. So they built this temporary arch out of wooden plaster. Um, some people really loved it and said, we want to have it stay forever. Other people said it's hideous. Um, the people that thought it was hideous, they won because it was temporary. It couldn't last anyway. So um, <clears throat> it, it, it goes away. Um, it was actually uh, designed by Thomas Hastings, a, a designer from, uh, from New York, and it's modeled on the Arch of Constantine. So again, very much going back to this established language of memorials to locate World War I and its memory in a broader historical um, uh, past. Um, <clears throat> then we have, of course, the, um, the, the, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier uh, here in Arlington. <clears throat> 
uh, which is which is set up um, in in 1921, um, there's a there's a, 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 a national funeral that the, the 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 soldier lays in state in, in the capital. There's a parade. Wilson actually makes one of his last public appearances briefly for this, um, <clears throat> and then the soldier is, um, uh, is 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 laid to 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 rest here. And again, we'll come back to this, but this always reminds me a bit of one of the mounds from ancient Greece. This giant sarcophagus that is put over this gravesite. I mean, again, you can see that um, <clears throat> the 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 Greek mounds, the Egyptian pyramids, there's that kind of uh, a formal um, echo that's taking place there. So this is the landscape of, of, of memorials uh, in, in the United States as, as the First World War um, ends and we enter the interwar period. <clears throat> but there's also a debate that emerges, and this is a debate that will carry over into 1945. Some people um, after World War II uh, began saying, not only are the Doughboy statues hideous and, and useless, um, but they're, they're, they're missing the point. Um, they, they're not the kind of memorial, memorials that we need in the 20th century. They're a 19th century holdover. Um, <clears throat> these progressive reformers, you know, the progressive movement's quite large in the US at this time. They felt that the, um, <clears throat> that the, the landscape of these, these horrendous uh, individual soldiers' memorials were, were, were just atrocious, that we needed something new. So they started calling for living memorials, memorials that could be places where the community comes together um, to sort of bridge its differences and unite as Americans. And so one of the examples we see of this, this is the War Memorial Building in Baltimore. Um, <clears throat> and again, very traditional architecture columns. I mean, it looks like something out of ancient Rome, uh, <clears throat> but it isn't just a statue, it's a place. And if you go inside on the names, uh, on the walls are names by county of soldiers from Maryland who served uh, in the First World War. But the most important, the sort of functional point of this memorial is this large space here that is designed uh, with a stage. Uh, you can set chairs up, there are pews here. Um, you can have all kinds of Memorial Day, Veterans Day ceremonies. Um, <clears throat> you can have, you know, public celebrations. There's now, I was there last year and was talking to one of the officials who works there and they've had graduation parties there. It's designed to be this public space. It's designed to be, you know, a living memorial, something that does uh, uh, more than, 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 than just, you know, be a statue and, and, and list these names. It's trying to incorporate people's lives uh, into memory of those who, who are no longer um, there. Um, <clears throat> so, 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 so this is, this is, I think, um, you know, a really interesting debate here. How is it that we're going to um, remember the war? Should we continue to use these traditional statues or should we come up with something new, this kind of living memorial um, moment? Um, I wanna read you a, a quote from, uh, from someone in the traditionalist memorial camp, someone uh, uh, writing in the 30s who said that this type of memorial is, is missing the point. People are gonna come together and have a party and celebrate and they won't be thinking about the war at all in a way that just a doughboy statue makes them. Um, <clears throat> so this is this traditional view, which I would say very much wins out after World War I. This is what this, uh, what, what, what this critic writes. He says, the monument in our park or square is permanent. Neither fire nor the progress of science will destroy it. Commerce dares not hope to banish it. It may be a poor piece of art, but on Memorial Day, we gather there with bared heads and pay tribute to the glorious men of another day. We cannot gather about some pile of money, which is left as a memorial fund. Our old memorial hall will not accommodate us, but here beneath the shadow of this sacred monument, we collect as a congregation about its altar. Notice the liturgical, the religious language there. And we pay sincere and inspiring tribute to the memory of the thousands who gave up life forever that we might enjoy liberty and freedom. And I think the interesting thing here is that both camps are trying to find a way to give uh, respect, to pay respect and, 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 and to give honor to those who died for liberty and freedom. But there's this division after World War I about what the best way to do that is. And that debate carries precisely over into memories of, of the Second World War. So 
when we when we talk about World War One and, and the memorial landscape being a debate over how do we how do we uh, how do we remember those who fought to defend democracy? I mean, that tells us a lot about what the war was about, right? People felt that this was a war for democracy, which is what Wilson talked about. Um, so as we look at World War II, then I think it's worth asking what is what what did people at the time in 1945, you know, in the 1950s, what did they think World War II was about? So to, uh, oh, oh, I forgot this, this one cartoon um, I wanted to show you, which I just think is great. So this is a cartoon that runs um, uh, in, in 1919, and it's, it's making fun of this useful memorial uh, system, right? So the Lincoln Memorial Garage, where you've got an ancient Egyptian pyramid, add space to let, like we can just put whatever we want on there. The Triumph Apartments, an apartment shaped like a victory arch. I mean, so, you know, critics are being <clears throat> really sort of brutal with this living memorial monument. And for the most part, as I said, they, they, they went out. I mean, we, we don't see a whole lot of these living memorials. All right. So World War II, what's World War II about? Well, if we look at the art of the period, some of the art of the period is the most iconic propaganda posters. Um, here we've got Norman Rockwell's 1943 drawing, the very famous uh, uh, picture here of a family having dinner. You see it on Thanksgiving cards uh, throughout the, the second half of the 20th century. Um, <clears throat> you know, this is really echoing uh, FDR's For Freedom speech. Um, this idea of American liberty and freedom, prosperity, plenty of food, uh, happiness. I mean, the sort of fulfillment of the American dream is there, right? That's what, that's what the country is, 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 is fighting for. Um, here we have the, uh, the very famous poster, J. Howard Miller, the, the Westinghouse uh, Production Company's poster um, uh, that, that, that calls on, on, on women. Um, Rosie the Riveter, the famous character here, we can do it. Um, and here we have this triumphalism of the American spirit, right? To roll up your sleeves and accomplish whatever it is that you want to accomplish. And, and then we have this poster here, um, a, a photograph by Alexander Lieberman, um, United we win. So it's this, this idyllic vision of America is what we're fighting for, right? Through this fight, the country and its racial divisions will be healed and will come together as United Americans. So it's this idea, basically World War II is about defending a way of life. It's about defending our, our prosperity, our happiness, uh, our, our, our um, ability to, to accomplish whatever we want. So this is the way in which many people spoke about and understood the Second World War during the war. And I think that's important to keep in mind that when you look at the ways in which they tried to remember the Second World War. So <clears throat> what happens after, after World War II? Well, um, abroad and from an official level, kind of more of the same. Um, the American Battle Monument Commission continues its work abroad, makes very few aesthetic changes. Um, we, we, we really see very little change. In fact, as I said, so many of these, these World War I cemeteries and memorials are finished just in the 1930s. Um, that, in, you know, the decision is made. These were very expensive. They took a long time to build. Um, let's just expand on what we have rather than build entirely new cemeteries and memorials dedicated to just World War II. So for example, in Suren, uh, what you have um, is the expansion of the chapel. These two loges are added on either side, uh, one now for each World War with inscriptions um, to the missing and to the dead from those two uh, conflicts. And I have some photos uh, that I will that I'll show you um, just a, a, a couple of statistics for this. Um, so at Seren itself, there are actually burial plots for 24 unknown soldiers from the Second World War that are added to this uh, to this cemetery. Um, the expansion of the cemetery of the of the chapel in particular cost between 520 uh, and about 600 thousand dollars. So this was not a cheap uh, in, in endeavor. Um, though it was cheap relative to what was spent on some other cemeteries. Uh, each of the chapels is 64 feet, uh, or each of the, um, the, the added on chapels are 64 feet from, from the main building. So there's a cemetery here. And if you look, as you walk along this, uh, this pathway, it's enclosed on three sides, but you can always look out these windows, uh, if you will, and see the graves and see, of course, Paris, which you would be looking at from there. Um, <clears throat> The, 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 this whole cemetery was rededicated in 1952, um, and the ceremony here at Seren was the largest, had the most uh, grandeur and splendor and the most officials attending, and the U.S. government sort of says, well, we'll just make this the big ceremony for everything for World War II. Um, there are smaller cemeteries or, or smaller ceremonies held at other cemeteries um, uh, uh, marking the Second World War, but by and large, they sort of do a, a, a kind of a one ceremony for all here. Um, so I have a, 
I also wanted to read you a, a, a quote as, as you look at the inscription on the inside of the, uh, of the walkway for the Second World War to the eternal memory of 360,817 Americans who gave their lives uh, in the service of their country during World War II. Um, of this uh, host, 116,808 rest in 18 overseas military cemeteries. The remains uh, of 175 were returned to their homeland. Of those resting in the overseas military cemeteries, 8,483 have not been identified. Theirs are among the 78,917 names of those missing in action or lost or buried at sea, uh, which are recorded upon the walls of the cemetery memorials. Uh, into thy hands, O Lord. So that's the inscription for the Second World War. Um, and I want to read you what, what an, an American official writes about this cemetery and all cemeteries in, in 1947. Um, <clears throat> so regarding the, the overall scope of the commemorative project for World War II, um, this official writes, uh, this is an official from the, 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 the Battle Monument Commission, um, that the permanent cemeteries with their memorial chapels and museums would constitute monuments to the military operations as well as memorials to the dead and that the duplication by the erection of nearby large monuments is in general unnecessary. So there's this decision basically that we're gonna use what we've already built and we're not gonna spend more money to build more. So um, there is not this broad sweeping uh, wholly dedicated World War II memorial landscape that we see, which is why, if you were wondering at the beginning, boy, I thought this was a talk about World War II. Why is this guy talking about World War I? Well, I think you have to understand the First World War landscape because that is in large part the World War II uh, memorial landscape. So just again, uh, so you have that inscription on the wall here as you walk down the hallway, um, you have these um, <clears throat> reliefs of, of soldiers from the Second World War, and then you can see this uh, marble figure, uh, female figure in mourning uh, at the bottom hallway here. Um, and you can see her, there's a, a, a semi a laurel wreath and it says 19, um, uh, 41 to 45. The World War I um, room on the exact opposite end looks uh, the same obviously with with different dates, the inscription I'll read, this memorial has been erected by the United States of America in proud and grateful memory of her soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen who laid down their lives in all quarters of the earth that other peoples might be freed from oppression. Let us here highly resolve that these honored dead shall not have died in vain. You know, I like this, um, uh, lay down their lives in all quarters of the earth that other peoples might be freed from oppression, right? That takes us back to American understandings of the war. Look at the propaganda posters. It's about freedom. It's about prosperity. Uh, and it's about uh, fighting to, um, uh, to preserve that and to protect the, the, those, those uh, ideals wherever they uh, were not existing as, uh, uh, during, during the Second World War. Of course, then we also have... Um, uh, a few cemeteries that, that are built for the Second World War, not everything is repurposed. This is the Normandy American Cemetery at Colville-sur-Mer, uh, right, uh, right on the sea, a very famous. You've seen this probably in a lot of films and photos. The sculpture in the center courtyard here is the spirit of American youth uh, rising uh, from the waves. Uh, but this is, again, a kind of, there aren't many individual, relatively speaking, um, World War II memorials and cemeteries that are built. There's rather an effort to try and reuse what had been, what had been done. So what happens back in the U.S.? Um, what happens back in the U.S. Is, is, is a great example of it here. Um, this is actually a memorial uh, in Malvern, Pennsylvania, a very small town outside of Philadelphia. I'm not sure if anybody's been there. Um, <clears throat> this is the kind of stuff I'm always doing. We pulled up in a traffic light. I saw this. My wife said, what are you doing? I said, I got to get a picture of this because this is exactly what happens after World War II. This is the original World War I monument, a plaque on this stone here. There's an eagle in the carving, a place to hold flags. Um, you can imagine, obviously, the city landscape has, has changed. This was probably more in a park in, 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 in the interwar period. And then after World War II, what happens is that same space simply has another tablet with World War II veterans added to it. That's a very common move that we see. Um, again, Frederick is a bit of an exception. There is a specific, uh, a unique World War II memorial that's in Mount Olivet Cemetery and a World War II wall uh, in, in Memorial Park. But most towns and cities do this, make this exact 
um, move. And I think one of the reasons this happens is that there is not a massive outcry from veterans uh, after World War II for a memorial. There is just not this big push that we need to have a kind of, uh, you know, not a, a doughboy, but a GI, uh, a, a GI Joe statue somewhere in, um, uh, in, in, in our town square. There isn't this major uh, push for that. Um, and there's also a concern for costs. And there's also a growing living memorial movement that is now uh, going to win the debate in the 40s, 50s, and 60s in ways that it didn't in the 20s and 30s. Um, we have then uh, the, the, the the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, again, uh, originally um, um, you know, created in, in, in 1921, uh, this, this neoclassical white marble sarcophagus with the three Greek figures of peace, victory, and valor. Um, here rests an honored glory, an American soldier known but to God. That's the inscription uh, that's on the sarcophagus, which is put there in 1931. But the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier has a really interesting, I think, history. I'm sure most of you have, have been there. If you haven't, well, don't go right now. You can't. But when it reopens, you got to go. Um, <clears throat> it became a very popular place for people to hang out. People started having picnics up on this, on this hill, on this beautiful vista. Um, and people got offended by that and said, we shouldn't be having picnics and hanging out and, and, and sort of, you know, um, kind of having fun here. Here's this living memorial debate entering back in. And so in 1926, Congress actually adds the idea of having a guard um, there. The guard is there not so much uh, originally to guard the tomb, but, but to keep the public off the grave. Um, what I think is interesting about this is now how many times have you, uh, if you live in the area, have you taken friends or family down there and people want to, to go to this place? And usually, at least in my experience, what I hear them say is, we want to see the changing of the guard. Not, we want to see the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. This guard has almost become the attraction in that place. It's what people go. They actually time their arrival at the site based on the, the schedule of the changing of the guard. So what does that do for this, this, this memorial landscape? What is the point of a focus there? And then it grows even more complicated. In 1958, they actually add at the base here unknown soldiers from the Second World War and the Korean War. It actually was... Um, it took some time to get an unknown soldier from the Second World War to choose them. Of course, there's multiple fronts, the Pacific, the Atlantic. Uh, where are we going to select this, this, this figure from? It was, it was, a, it was a difficult process. Um, and then in the 1980s, Vietnam, um, there's an unknown uh, a veteran of Vietnam who is, who is added here as well. And so um, these memorial landscapes start becoming not individual, but, but layered. Um, uh, drawing again on the classical tradition, but 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 using that tradition to 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 commemorate multiple events in one specific place. There are a few memorials built in the U.S. Um, by the uh, by by the U.S. government. Um, there was not a national memorial. Uh, in part, this is because the geography of the war is very difficult. Um, I always remind my students when we talk about World War I, uh, we tend to think of just Europe and that's really wrong because there's fighting everywhere. It really is a world war. Uh, but for American involvement, it was a war in Europe. But the Second World War is not as easy, right? Americans are fighting in the Pacific, they're fighting in the Atlantic. Um, the geography of this is really difficult. And so what the US government actually does um, in the 1960s, the Battle Monument Commission erects a series of three memorials. Um, this is the West Coast Memorial, um, which is in San Francisco. Um, just off of your screen, if you were standing here and you look probably 100 yards away is the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and on it are the names of all those um, Americans lost um, in the Pacific. And I'll show you the view. So if you, if you have this wall behind you, that's what you're looking at. I mean, it's just, it's beautiful. If you, if you go to San Francisco and the Golden Gate Bridge, it's, it's definitely worth a stop. Uh, there's also a memorial to the Atlantic uh, front that's in Battery Park in New York. And then there's a third memorial um, in, in Honolulu that was put there in, in 1966. So there is an attempt to try and build, to try and create some sort of, 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 of memorial, official memorial landscape in the US um, that's, that's just dedicated to World War II, but it's again, divided geographically. And you know, this is in part why the, the, uh, the opening of the, the World War II Memorial on the Mall um, was, was such a big deal because it, it finally tried to create a single uh, space to remember World War II uh, in, in the US. Okay, 
if, if, if you're wondering, well, were there any soldier statues after the Second World War? Well, not many, but there is one exception. And I think the story is, is interesting and, and kind of fun. So um, the Marine Corps Memorial in Arlington, the, the famous Iwo Jima Memorial is actually based on, on a photograph by Joseph Rosenthal taken of, of five Marines and a Navy medic raising the flag during the, during the, the, the fighting to, to take Iwo Jima. This hits the press. It becomes hugely popular um, in, in, in the U.S. Um, after its publication in early, I think it's February of, uh, of 45. It just captures the public imagination. Congress loved it. Um, and so Congress actually um, quickly introduces a bill uh, to try and create a memorial based on this on this photograph. Um, and so there's a sculptor, an Austrian-born sculptor, um, Felix uh, de Welden, which is interesting because the, the, the sculptor of the World War II memorial on the mall was also um, Austrian-born. It's just by happenstance, coincidence. Um, and so De Weldon creates this temporary uh, uh, sculpture based on this, this photo. It sits on the Capitol grounds. Um, the, the Congress, like I said, loves it. The Marine Corps loved it. And they said, we want this to be uh, our permanent memorial. And we'd like to put it in Arlington National Cemetery. Um, the Commission of Fine Arts said, uh, no, this is awful. Um, this is just more of the same. This doesn't capture what World War II was all about. This is more soldier. Um, soldier sculpture, and, and we, 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 don't need, we don't need more of this. Um, Congress and the White House and the Marine Corps won, obviously, the memorial is, is built. Um, the funny part of the story to me is uh, President Truman actually makes De Weldon, the sculptor, a member of the Commission of Fine Arts um, because he thought this sculpture was so great. And I can just imagine how tense those meetings were because they didn't like his work and now this guy's part of their uh, part of their committee. I'm sure that wasn't a, a, a popular move. Um, the traditionalists though um, are, are ultimately going to, to, to lose this battle because this is the kind of exception that proves the rule. We aren't going to see by and large many of these statues. We're not gonna see a lot of sculpture. Um, we're just, we're just not. This is, this is sort of the, the kind of a one and done. And I want to read you something that somebody from the National Sculpture Society uh, wrote in 1951 about this. He said, circumstances and conditions during the past 25 years have not been kind to sculpture. It is today almost completely overlooked as decoration for homes, for gardens, and for public architecture. Its use for commemorative monuments uh, has of recent years faced much opposition. If ever sculpture uh, was in doubt, um, it is now and the oblivion is near. I mean, this is kind of depressing to read. I mean, he's basically saying it's over for sculpture and in part it kind of is. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with the ways in which the public understood World War II um, and the just growing now uh, a critique of the memorial landscapes that had existed since the Civil War. And so what we start to see then is this living memorial moment um, reemerge. Um, and so this is where you start to see this call for memorial stadiums and memorial highways and um, on and on and on. This is a cover of one of the architectural magazines at the time talking about memorials that live, right? Because the world, the, the Second World War was about defending Americans' way of life. And so the memorial should enable that way of life. And so what we get is this, um, and I'm sure you've all seen examples of them, like memorial bridge, Memorial Highway, Memorial Stadium, Memorial Hall, uh, whatever the case may be. This moment that starts after World War I now really begins to gain ground through the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, uh, and you get all of these kind of living um, uh, memorials. There's also calls at this time um, to move away from the traditional symbols and classical architecture and to create something new, right? The idea that World War II marked a whole new kind of war. It's total war. It's the 20th century. Um, it was in many ways far more horrific than any war we had ever seen. And, and it raises all kinds of questions about how do you capture this in a memorial landscape, right? How do you capture something like genocide, the Holocaust? Um, how do you capture the, the bombing of civilian populations? How do you capture the blurring of the line between soldiers and civilians? This isn't a war like we'd seen wars in the 19th and the 18th centuries. And so some said, well, we need to move away then from traditional styles and aesthetics and build something um, with, with, with modernist principles, which were in vogue at the time. And, and, and what we see here is the proposal for just that submitted in 1940, 
five uh, by um, an architect, a sculptor named Louis I. Kahn. Um, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a proposal for a World War II memorial that is erected out of these sort of soaring uh, hollow steel uh, tubes, if you will. I'm not gonna judge the aesthetics, but I will point out the problem that emerges. I'm guessing as I put this up, very few of you actually thought World War II. And this is the problem that the modernist and to some extent the living memorial movement run, runs into in the 50s and 60s is that it's one thing to wanna to move away from the past and to mark a new war with new language. But doing it this way tells you nothing about the past event you're trying to remember. You need some sort of plaque, you need a stele, uh, you need some sort of mound, you need some sort of cross, you need something to let people know that this abstract form is actually a kind of memorial. And so try as you may to get away from the established language of memorials, it actually proves very hard. And so I think this is why we see very few modern memorials and more uh, of these kind of living memorials, these highways and things. Um, if you wait to the 21st century, you start to get some examples, I think, where we start to see some interesting combinations of traditional and, and, and more modern, more abstract memorials. This is a memorial in Washington, DC, um, dedicated in 2001. It's a 14 foot tall bronze statue of two Japanese cranes um, ensnared in, in, in barbed wire. And it's the Japanese American uh, memorial to patriotism during World War II. And it's a memorial to those Japanese who served and a reminder that, um, that the Japanese were loyal. This is a very much a pushback or critique of the internment camps of the racism of, of American policies during, um, during the second World War II toward the Japanese American population. Um, it's not a soldier, it's not a human being, it's, it's a little abstract, but it still draws on some traditional forms. You recognize it as a kind of memorial space. And so I think it's trying to negotiate a compromise. Um, other things that you start to see appear, particularly in the second part, you know, the, by, by, by this, the second half of the Cold War, the, the late 70s, the 80s, the 90s, where, where we start to grapple with how to remember the Holocaust as we start to see Holocaust memorials appear in cities across the country. This is in Philadelphia. This one is in um, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And one of the things that strikes me whenever I see these Holocaust memorials is they are almost always abstract, at least in part. I mean, the, the, the Harrisburg one, for instance, has these steel columns and then wrapped around it is this um, sort of odd rusted sculpture that if you're close enough, it sort of looks like barbed wire, but it's not a realistic interpretation of it around the base of the names of the concentration camps, but not a realistic traditional, you know, open colonnade or soldier statue or anything like that. It's really a kind of abstract form and a nod that what we're trying to remember here is something unlike anything we've tried to remember before. Um, then of course we have the uh, addition of the National World War II uh, Memorial uh, on the Mall. Um, President Clinton actually signs the law. This process gets going in, in uh, the, the mid nineties. It's in May of 93, I believe that Clinton signs the, uh, the, the law authorizing the um, Battle Monument Commission to, 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 to have a, a design competition and, and open this up and begin the process. Um, again, it really doesn't come from veterans of the Second World War. It came from later generations who began to realize that the, that the greatest generation was beginning to um, sadly to die off, that there wasn't a memorial, that they weren't included on this space uh, in DC and that that needed to be um, fixed. The thing to keep in mind here, I think you have to remember that throughout really uh, up until the 70s and the 80s, I mean, the, the mall was not a collection of war memorials in the way that it is now. I mean, this 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 begins with, with, with Maya Lin's wall. You have then the Korean memorial. And once you start having all these other memorials represented, that started to raise the question, well, why is World War II um, not represented? Um, of course, World War I is, is also not represented, but that's, that's a, a, another story for another day. Um, an architect uh, out of, out of uh, Providence, Rhode Island, Friedrich St. Florian, an Austrian born sculptor or architect designs this. Um, his sculpture was, in, or his design was incredibly controversial. A lot of critics dismissed it. It goes through several reiterations. Um, you know, some of the, some of the strongest critiques of, uh, of, of this design were that it looks like something you'd see in, in fascist Italy or Nazi Germany, that it's this sort of heavy, 
um, uh, granite construction columns, the, the, the Greco Roman, uh, Roman Greco forms. I mean, it's just more of the same and it looks totalitarian in its, in its space. And I think, I, I'm not gonna say whether I agree with that critique, but I think you're right, but that's just because the totalitarian societies and American society, they're both part of the Western tradition that would, it would make sense that they're both drawing then on the same language, the same Western language in these memorial landscapes. Um, so you have uh, either side um, for the Atlantic, for the Pacific. Of course, the names of the states are on all of the, um, the, 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 the columns here. There are 24 bronze bas-relief panels, uh, which tell the story of the home front uh, during, um, uh, during the Second World War. Um, and then, like I said, you've got granite columns for, uh, for each state. The most controversial thing about this was, was its location, right? I mean, it's right here. The Washington Monument is right here. The Lincoln Memorial is right here. And for uh, since time and memoriam, the plan for the, for the mall had been to have this vista from the Capitol through the Washington Monument and then down toward a Lincoln Memorial. What does it mean then to stick this, this new memorial right in the middle of that landscape, which is in part why why the taller portions of the memorial are off to the side so that that line of sight is not entirely broken. Um, again, just some, you know, the, the Atlantic um, uh, side here, you have the, the, the fountains in the middle, the columns with, with, the, uh, with the reeds for each state, of course, framing the, the, the Washington Monument there. Um, you don't have any soldiers. There, this isn't a soldier statue. You do have the soldiers represented though here, but by stars. So we have an abstract representation, um, which, which I think is an interesting move. And I also think this is memorial in many ways for, for all the reasons that it was critiqued. It actually negotiates a compromise between the traditional memorial camp and the living memorial camp. Um, the traditional memorial camp, I mean, it certainly is traditional with its columns and its, and its enormity and its triumphalism and its symbolism. But it's also a living memorial. I mean, this, this, this pool, these fountains have been a place for people to gather. And I was joking with Kristen yesterday, if any of you have ever been on the mall in the summer, even if you don't get in the water, just arriving at this place and feeling the cool water is just so nice. And I have to be honest, when you're taking in that refreshment, you may not exactly be thinking about World War II. You're just thinking about, oh my gosh, it's hot and humid. And this water looks really inviting. Um, but you're in this, this, this space and you're living life, which is exactly what the living memorial uh, proponents wanted. And so I think in the end, this thing sort of splits the difference where on the surface, it just looks like more of the same, the traditional monument, which so many people were, were upset about. I, I want to point out one uh, one thing about this. So um, the, the architecture community, the art community, scholarly community, they didn't like this. They dismissed this thing. But a lot of the public loved it, particularly the, uh, the, the veterans and their families. Um, and there was um, an article that ran in the, in, in the Washington Post. Um, and a lot of the Post writers were, were critical of the, of the memorial. Um, and, you know, they, they went down and they interviewed visitors trying to get them, I guess, to sort of join the bandwagon and say that the memorial was awful. And, and the one quote here um, that I think is great, they interviewed this woman um, uh, whose husband, I believe, had, had served in the war. Um, and, you know, they, they were prompting, I think, with questions like, well, isn't this thing awful? And the woman says the following quote, as long as it's a memorial, it could be a hole in the ground with a plaque on it and it wouldn't matter. So the art community is up in arms. This thing looks like a totalitarian nightmare. This is a disaster. But the public was just grateful to have this memorial there. The aesthetic debates didn't matter. It's almost the reverse of what you see with, with Maya Linswall with the Vietnam Memorial, um, whereby the art community loved it because it is in many ways very abstract and, and it can actually be kind of confusing. Uh, and the public wasn't really sure what to do with it because it wasn't a traditional form. So. Um, I want, to, I want to close then just thinking about, you know, what would, um, I, I, historians, I think we get in trouble when we try to deal with the future because we barely manage the past. But if we could just indulge for a minute, um, what, what is it going to look like when we celebrate Memorial um, Day or VE Day uh, or Veterans Day in 75 years from now? Right. I mean, what what will our memorial spaces look like toward the end of a 21st century that I can only imagine will become uh, well, shall we say, no less technological than it is now. I mean, we're now 
living more virtually than we ever have before. But if we're honest, before the current pandemic, we were doing more and more online. We live with smartphones, we live in cyberspace more and more. What does that mean then for memorial spaces, whether they're modern, they're, 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 they're abstract, they're traditional, they're, they're soldier statues, what does that mean for those spaces? If more and more of our life is interactive, if it's virtual, um, how will we remember um, uh, past events in, in that world? And this, I think, is an interesting suggestion. Um, so this is, an, ex this is a, an experiment, if you will, that was run in 2017 in Germantown, um, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia, where a sculptor um, took a memorial to a revolutionary war conflict, which Americans actually lost. And that's what is under this glass. I've been in that square for a long, long time. And she said, well, you know, this is a, this is a war that no one who passes this park has any connection to. Their parents don't, their grandparents don't, their, their great-grandparents probably even don't. So it's just become this thing that we ride by. So what would it mean to sort of rethink our connection to the past? So she covered the whole memorial in, in mirrors, as you can see here, so that the whole thing becomes this kind of reflection of individuals in their community and invites you to sort of think about yourself and your relationship to this place. And I think this is a really interesting example. I'm not saying I think all World War II memorials or memorials are going to look like this in the future. But I do think that this gets at the kind of interactivity that we're seeing more and more with smartphones, uh, with, with museums, with touch screens. Um, and I think it's the kind of memorials that we could expect in the future. I also think it's possible that we could start to see memorials existing in cyberspace. Um, I, I don't know that for future generations, the town square, the park, um, the memorial hall are going to have the same import that they did for earlier generations. Um, I, I'm just not sure that that's, that, that, that that's the case. Um, but I have no idea what the future will hold. I just, I think it will be different. And I thought this is a good example um, of that. So I just, I wanted to close um, on this. We're gonna take questions, but I did wanna mention, as Kristen said at the outset, that um, uh, I am the, the director of Hood's um, Master of Arts and Humanities program. It's a program that serves um, a, a lot of teachers in the area looking for more content knowledge, um, but also frankly, a lot of lifelong learners, I imagine folks like, like the audience. And so I just wanted to mention, um, you can actually take courses as, an, as a non-degree student. Um, and we've got some great courses coming up, things I thought might be um, interesting, I just wanted to mention. So this summer, um, in the summer two term, we have a course on faith and belief in America, looking at the role that faith, not just Christianity, um, has played in shaping American uh, culture, American art and literature and music. I thought that might be interesting. Also kind of an interesting topic to reflect on when we're going through what we're going through right now. And then this fall, we have two courses that I think could be quite interesting. We have one um, on wartime literature and music in the 20th century. So the ways in which literature and music um, have captured art and remembered art, or, or, or war rather. Um, and then we have um, the Art and Music Pro Seminar, which is a kind of um, overview of um, musical and artistic traditions in, in, in the Western canon from about 1500 forward. So if anybody's interested in more about those courses, I can send you descriptions and whatnot. My email address is there and I'll go ahead and leave that up. Um, but, but, but that's what I have to, to, to offer for better or worse. And so I'll, um, I'm happy to, to try to answer any questions that you have. We do have a question from the audience. Okay. Um, and that is, uh, what was the US policy regarding the burial of German and Italian POWs during World War II? That's a good question. Um, I confess I don't have that policy document on the top of my head. I do know that um, some, I wanna say many were, were actually repatriated. Um, some are buried here. Um, I do know the policy of the reverse, which was that American soldiers would not um, lay buried on uh, enemy soil. So if they had fallen in Germany or Italy, they would be moved to somewhere else. But if they fell in France, uh, they, were, they were buried in France. Um, that was something, it's, it's, a, it's a good question, the, the, the whole issue of burial. Um, you know, the US government at the end of World War I said, the long and the short of it, and I can recommend some, some well, it's difficult reading, but it's, it's fascinating history. The long and the short of it was the US government didn't want to spend all the money to bring everybody home. So the idea um, was hopefully we can let people stay where they fell. But 
that's not very democratic. So the US, unlike some of the other allied powers, gave the public the choice. They let families choose. And about 70% of families after the First World War, and I think a similar number after World War II, made the decision to have their loved ones removed um, and exhumed and sent home. Um, so what you see buried in Europe are about the 30% or so that, um, uh, that remain. But again, if anybody had fallen in enemy territory, um, Soviet territory for that matter as well, they were moved and relocated to allied um, to allied ground. But the specifics, the statistics and things on German POWs, that one I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I, 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 well, I do want to add one thing. Um, there are um, there are German cemeteries in uh, in Britain and France as well that I visited. Um, this is actually a clause of the Treaty of Versailles, and actually goes back to an 1871 treaty that basically soldiers have the right to lie where they fell, um, and that those countries have a responsibility to take care of those graves. And so you actually find um, uh, in in Western France German cemeteries. Um, the cemeteries almost always have um, dark metal gray. Um, steel crosses. They're often buried multiple soldiers to a grave. You'll see four names on a cross. Um, they're maintained, but they're not covered in flags. There aren't memorials. They're not glorious um, at all. Similar situation in, um, in, 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 in Britain as well. So, uh, While we're waiting for some more questions to come in, um, I had a question. Yeah. Um, you, you were talking about how um, you know, there was kind of a doubling up of of um, memorials. So yeah. there is a war, World War One memorial, and so a World War Two memorial would be added, and then you know subsequent wars sometimes are added to those two. Um, and I'm wondering if the or how to what extent the um, tightening of belts that, that happened during the Great Depression ends up that mindset kind of filters into this frugality that happens regarding memorializing World War II. Oh, it, it clearly does. That clearly, that clearly factors into this. And I, I think you see that reflected in the 40s and 50s. Um, and even as the economy is recovering after the Second World War, I think there's a sense that a better use of resources would be to build that next school, that next uh, bus terminal, that next park, and let's call it a memorial along the way, but let's be good, uh, make, make good use of our resources. So I think that that clearly factors into that as well. Um, I think that's also what's behind, I mean, the, the Americans, unlike the British, so the British have a policy where after the First World War, their soldiers, I mean, they literally are buried where they fell, um, and they might be moved, you know, 10 feet or so as they bring these cemeteries together, but the whole landscape of Eastern France is dotted with these British garden looking cemeteries, um, because that was the rule. You're not going back to Britain, they're staying there. Um, the US consolidates, let's put them in, 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 in a few, um, there's eight major cemeteries, um, which was which was a, a tremendous expense, but certainly better than maintaining multiple cemeteries um, like the British have. So that absolutely plays into it. There's definitely an economics behind this. Um, it doesn't look like there's any other questions coming in. Um, so I am going to say thank you so much um, for joining us, Dr. Campion, and thank you everybody who watched on the live stream. Um, the chat is gonna close after we end the live stream, but please feel free to ask questions in the comments box um, for the recorded video, which will be here at the same link or even better, send them directly to Dr. Campion's email address, which is on the screen right now. Um, if you enjoyed the video, give it a like, please, and check out the other videos on our channel. If you like what you see there, subscribe to our channel and tap the notification bell to get notified of future videos. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Campion, and everybody uh, have a great day and hope to see you again soon. Thanks, everyone.